John Wilkes Booth stood in the back of Ford's theater. His body was hidden by the darkness. No one even particularly noticed him standing there in the dress circle. He was scanning the crowded theater. There was not an empty seat. At first, he was afraid the object of his plot was not present, but then as his eye fell on box seven, he could distinctly make out the silhouettes of four figures. First, Major Rathbun. Seated next to him was his fiancée, Clara Harris. There was a bit of space, and then Mrs. Lincoln, and finally on the far right, President Abraham Lincoln. He was so tall that his head stuck up above the horsehair rocker. You could clearly make out that distinguished profile even in the dim light of the theater. Booth made his way along the dress circle aisle until he came to the door that would admit him to the hallway that led to box number seven. When he opened the door, a few people turned and glanced in his direction, but no one took particular alarm or even recognized who he was. He closed the door behind himself and for the first time allowed himself to think of a successful end to this mission. No one had stopped him. No one had questioned his presence. There was no confrontation. This was going to be easier than he thought. Standing behind the closed door, he reached down in the darkness and felt along the wall until he found the board that he had placed there earlier in the day. He slipped the board beneath the doorknob and jammed the door shut. Now that he had built this little barricade, no one could follow him and stop him from doing the deed. He slid like a snake down the dark hallway, making his way toward the door of box number seven. A tiny pin of light shone through the gimlet hole that he had bore into the door earlier that afternoon. Placing his eye up to that light, he looked in on the President of the United States. You could hear the actors on the stage below. Mr. Booth knew this play well. He could quote every line. In a few minutes, the ladies who were now on stage would exit, and then only Mr. Hawk, one of the actors would be on the stage by himself, lit in a bright spotlight. Standing in the bright light, he would not be able to see Mr. Booth or what he was about to do. Booth waited until the audience started to laugh at something funny happening upon the stage, and then he put his hand on the doorknob and turned it and quickly admitted himself to the president's private box and shut the door behind him. The noise of the audience had covered any creaking of the ironwork on the hinges. Booth was just a few steps from the president. The derringer was in his hand. He was waiting. Now Mr. Hawk was alone on the stage. Booth raised the derringer until it was pointed at the back of Mr. Lincoln's head. When the audience burst into laughter, he squeezed the trigger. There was a loud pop, as if someone had broken a paper bag. But because of the laughter, people just 14 feet below had not even noticed. In fact, the other people seated next to the president didn't even turn. Mrs. Lincoln, after several seconds, turned to look at Mr. Lincoln, her face creased with laughter as if to say, Abraham, don't you think that was funny? Wasn't that a very witty line? But Mr. Lincoln was not smiling. In fact, his eyes were closed and his chin was resting on his chest. Mrs. Lincoln thought that perhaps because of the exhaustion of his administrative duties, he had fallen asleep in the dark, comfortable theater. She touched his hand as if to rouse him, but the president did not stir. And that is when Mrs. Lincoln noticed over her left shoulder a figure standing there in the darkness. There was a, a chrysanthemum of blue smoke uh, hovering above herself and above the president's head. Before she had time to question, the man brushed between her rocking chair and the president's chair. He turned and looked at the people seated in the box.
and very quietly, very calmly, not with any rage or strange expression on his face, he said, Sic semper tyrannis, Latin for thus always to tyrants. At that moment, Major Rathbone realized that an intruder was present, and he leaped from his chair, and he raised his arms to try to stop Mr. Booth. Booth came up with a sharp knife. He slashed down through Rathbone's sleeve into his flesh, cutting clean to the bone. Rathbone could feel his hot blood dripping into his sleeve, soaking his shirt. He grappled with Booth for just a second, and then Booth threw a leg over the edge of the box and started to climb down. As he lowered himself to the stage, his boot got caught in the Treasury Regimental flag. It tore on his spur and fell to the stage in tatters. When he landed on the stage, he braced himself, and the audience saw a man leaping out of the box, land on the stage, and they heard a distinct pop. This was the sound of Booth's ankle bone as it snapped inside of his boot. Limping badly, more or less walking on the side of his foot, Booth limped out of the theater. He turned and yelled to the audience, Revenge for the South! Mr. Hawk, the actor, was standing mid-stage in the spotlight, dumbfounded. He wasn't sure what was going on. Was this some sort of joke? Was it a surprise? This was not in the script. This is not how they rehearsed this show. People in the audience were stunned. They didn't know what had happened. Finally, from the darkness, they heard a scream. This was Mrs. Lincoln. She had just realized that she could not wake her husband. Her hand moved ner nervously up to her left cheek, and she started to stroke her cheek, but she could not utter any words. And then from the darkness, they heard Major Rathbone yell out, Stop that man! People leaped out of their seats. Someone turned up the gas lights. And now the whole place was pandemonium, as if someone had kicked over an ant's nest. People were running into the aisles. A few people climbed onto the stage. Other people were running for the exits. And then in the pandemonium, someone yelled out, He has shot the president! People were in a panic. Who had shot the president? Someone yelled out, It was Booth! It was John Wilkes Booth, the actor! Stop that man! Someone yelled from the stage. But Booth had already made his way to an exit door. In the alley, a young man stood holding a horse by its bridle. Booth kicked the fellow in the chest. He went sprawling across the cobblestones. Ah, he kicked me! He kicked me! Booth scrambled into the saddle and shot off down the street. Soon enough, he would be across the bridge and into Maryland and on his way to conspirators who would help him. His ankle must be broken, but because of the adrenaline rushing through his body, he did not even feel the pain. Farmers outside of Washington, D.C. reported later that just about this time, the moon emerged from dark clouds, red like blood. Inside the theater, everything was still absolute chaos. Someone was calling for water. Soldiers ran to the door and tried to knock it open, but it was jammed. Major Rathbone went to the door and he kept yelling at them to not press against the door until he could move the board. And then they burst into the box. He asked only for doctors to be admitted. Soon, a Dr. Leal was admitted to the box, and he began an examination of the patient. Help me, man, said Major Rathbone. I'm bleeding. He took one look at Rathbone and then quickly moved on to the president. The president seemed fine. There, there was no visible wound. The doctor asked for someone to strike matches. They lit matches to provide more light around the president, and then... He had the president taken out of his rocking chair and laid out on the floor. He saw Major Rathbone's knife wound. He had heard someone yell about a knife, and so he thought Mr. Lincoln had been stabbed. But he could find no blood. Finally, he tore away Mr. Lincoln's coat. He unbuttoned the vest. He unfastened the long gold watch chain. And then he asked for a pocket knife. He slit the shirt. He ripped the undershirt. The chest was laid bare. Absolutely no wound. He placed a hand behind the president's head and pulled it away wet. He pushed the president into a seated position and then started to probe the back of his head with his fingers. If the probing of his small finger was any evidence, the president had suffered a gunshot to the back of the head just behind the ear. The bullet had passed diagonally through the brain and had lodged behind his eye. The wound was fatal. The president was alive, but dying. Dr. Leal returned Lincoln's body to the floor, and then he asked the soldiers to clear a pathway. By this time, other doctors had been admitted to the box. 
they held a short conference. Laura Keene, the star actress of the show, had arrived with a pitcher of water. She asked if she could hold the president's head in her lap. The doctors nodded to her, and she sat down on the floor and cradled the president's great head with all of that brown shaggy hair and the distinctive beard for several minutes. And then soldiers lifted Mr. Lincoln's body from the floor and began to carry him out of the theater. When they finally made their way into the street, there was a collective gasp from the crowds that had already gathered there. Women and men were openly weeping. A path was cleared. They moved their way across the street. They started up the steps of a particular home. A soldier waved them off. No one was home and he didn't have a key. They entered the next house, the Peterson house. Mr. Peterson was a tailor. There was a small room under the stairs just down the hallway. The bed was very narrow and not long enough for the president's great frame. They moved it away from the wall and lay Mr. Lincoln across the bed diagonally. They called for water, heated blankets, mustard plasters were applied to his chest. They pulled the covers up to his great chin, propped him up with several pillows. Mrs. Lincoln was asked to wait in the parlor. They summoned Mr. Lincoln's private physician. They summoned Robert Lincoln. They summoned Lincoln's pastor. And then Dr. Leo pulled out his watch and started to mark the time of the president's last breath.